Hi everyone, how we doing? Good? Good? Come on, a bit more enthusiastic. How we doing everyone? Woo! Okay. Welcome. Thank you for making it to our demo moot. This is the first uh, public event that Warwick Law Soft Mooting is doing. Uh, this is Arjun Kamath, who will introduce hey him very shortly. I'm Harry Sun, both third year law students. Thank you for making the trek up to Gibbet Hill. Yeah, thanks guys. I have to admit this is uh, actually my first time coming from medical school, so it's been a bit of a day for me as well. But no, thank you for coming here and um, we appreciate that. It took a little bit of time, so hopefully it's going to be worth it. If you want to access the moot problem for today, scan the QR code, you should be able to see it. Um, and what we'll do is we'll just get straight into the moot and then we'll have a little bit of time afterwards where Harry and I are going to run through a few things um, which we're planning to do this year. So um, yeah, if our moots are ready and if our judge is ready, of course, we'll uh, we'll get straight into it. Do we give them all like 30 seconds to skim the case? Yeah, let's do that. You guys take a little read and then when you're ready, just give us a shout, yeah? Okay, have you got the um, <coughs> moot? Yeah. You got the uh, moot, yeah? No, no, not that. Oh, yeah, shit. Yeah, no, just okay. okay. Yeah. You've got the time. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, you know what is fine. Um, I got a list. Yeah. Okay, so mainly for the benefit of our mooters, mooters, hello. Um, here's how it's going to work. The, as I'm sure you know, the lead appellant has seven minutes. The junior has five. Um, please just pay attention to this laptop, which is going to be out front, which will show the time cards. Um, I do hope that we stick to the time. Thank you. Okay, hang on a minute. Uh, so the condition of access. So we're going to make a start. Uh, we are going to give you access to the document very soon. But in the meantime, over to our honourable judge and mooters. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Judge Vic Matoglu. Um, uh, welcome to the, uh, criminal, the, the Court of Appeal Criminal Division and to our moot today. Uh, we are hearing the case of um, uh, R, R and Walcott. And uh, without further ado, let me hand over to uh, uh, the last lead counsel for the appellants to uh, open the arguments. Just to check, is this picking me up? Yes. Okay, good. May it please your lordship, my name is Bernard Carter Avalon, and along with my learned junior, Miss Anjali Jane, we will be representing the appellant, Mr. Walcott. Mr. Connor Neo and Ms. Chelsea Choi will be representing the respondent in today's case, that being the Crown. I will be 
contending the first ground of appeal, namely that the sweeping interpretation of the case of Blau employed by the trial judge at first instance to the exclusion of other legal precedent contributed to an unjust ruling. And my junior will be contending the second ground, arguing that it was open to a properly directed jury to conclude that Mr. Stevens had voluntarily brought about his own death, thereby breaking the chain of causation. Before I move further, would your Lordship appreciate a brief reacquiescence with the facts of this case? A very brief one, please. Of course. After an uh, altercation between two street gangs, the victim, uh, Mr. Stevens, was stabbed by the respondent, by the appellant, Mr. Walcott. His injuries were neither life threatening nor difficult to treat. However, the victim refused uh, medical treatment on the grounds that he did not wish to come into contact with any black members of medical staff, and he subsequently died. Mr. Walcott was found guilty of his murder at first instance. On the matter of the first ground of appeal, I have two submissions to make. Uh, would your Lordship like to be reminded of what those are? Yes, please. Firstly, uh, I will be arguing that the ratio of the Crown and Blau does not deem all matters of opinion equally moral and un unquantifiable, as the original trial judge suggested, and that a decision to convict Mr. Walcott of murder nonetheless was unjust. And secondly, I will argue that Greville J's sole reliance on the case of Blau prevented the jury from scrutinizing the victim's actions in accordance with the test of reasonability set out in other precedent cases. May I move on to my first submission? No. I would like to begin by introducing to the court the case of Blau, first reported at page 1411 of the first volume of weekly law reports for the year 1975. Uh, the section interesting us can be found on pages six and seven of the bundle. Um, at this point, may I ask your Lordship to forego full case citations for the remainder of the moot? Absolutely. And may I also ask whether your Lordship would like to be reacquainted with the facts of this case? Uh, no, that's okay, I know the facts. Much obliged. The case of Blau pertained to a Jehovah's Witness who was stabbed and subsequently died after refusing life-saving treatment, which she deemed to be incompatible with her chosen faith. And at pages six and seven of the bundle in the highlighted section, we see Lord Justice Lawton exploring the reasons for why it couldn't actually be said whether or not the victim's actions were reasonable, unreasonable, justified, unjustified. Because of course, many religious views are simply unprovable or undisprovable beyond reasonable doubt. He asks by whose standard are we to judge these actions? Is it by uh, the opinions of Jehovah's Witnesses, of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, or of the man on the Clapham omnibus? And he decides here, rightly so, that a religious view should be counted as being representative of a person's thin skull in uh, reference to the thin skull rule, the rule which states that one must treat their victim as they find them. And the problem we encounter here is that at first instance, the judge interpreted this passage pertaining clearly to religious views as applying to all views. And the faulty logic behind this can be seen. The simplest way to do it is to substitute the key words in what he says. Would we really judge this kind of reasoning to be as uh, rightful if we were to ask, well, who is to decide whether or not uh, someone should treat black people as being equal to him. Um, by whose standards? The racist, the non-racist, the man on the Clapham omnibus? It's a non sequitur. And for this reason, it was unjust for the court to decide the case in such a fashion. The attempts to state otherwise, uh, frankly, judicially speaking, pushing a square peg in a round hole, passing off frankly speaking, a thick skull for a thin skull. And on this basis, we feel that the judge should have interpreted the case in a more lenient way, in a more responsible way. May I move on to my second submission? Much obliged. I would like to, at this point, introduce the case of the Crown against Williams and Davis. The section interesting us can be found at page 10 of the bundle, the ruling of Stuart Smith LJ. Uh, given that we are only interested in the ratio of this case, may I forego a summary here? Yeah. Much obliged. Now, we read in the section highlighted 
uh, Stuart Smith LJ states that the action of a victim, which is only in a very remote sense a consequence of the defendant's act, can break the chain of causation. Now, the question here, of course, would be, was the victim's refusal to seek medical care an obvious consequence of the stab wound? And the answer we must give is no. Logically, refusing medical care is the opposite of what a victim should do if they are injured. And I say logically because the test outlined here is objective. It is according to the judgment of a reasonable person of sound mind that we are to establish whether or not a victim's acts were firstly reasonable and secondly predictable in a way which would uh, take away responsibility uh, from the assailant for all actions following the victim's intervening act. Let me just stop you there for a moment. Can I just ask you, is it your view then that a person who is stabbed has an obligation to try and mitigate the injuries that were caused to them? Why can't they just allow themselves to die for whatever reason without breaking the chain of causation? Well, uh, matters pertaining to whether the chain of causation could be broken by omission in this case, I think will fall within my junior's purview. But I will say in my own name that it seems to us that in um, our country where medicine is free, where it is available, we can judge that the reasonable, the obvious, the default position, so to speak, would be to seek medical attention. I can see that my time is quickly coming to an end, and so could I um, ask for an initial minute to wrap up my points? Much obliged. Now, another part of this judgment, which I feel is very important, and specifically it's just one word, the word daft, borrowed from Lord Stevenson, who decided the case of the Crown and Roberts, which was analogous to this one. And the word daft is important because it is used here as a measure of the reasonability of what the victim did. Daftness truly is the measure by which we can establish whether a victim's act was reasonable or not. And the word daft is very difficult to obfuscate. And yet at first instance, when asked whether it is better to die than to be in the vicinity of a black person, whether that is daft, the court seemed to yield a decision of not daft enough. And for this reason, we feel that it is of very big importance to decide in this case that firstly, the case of Blau cannot be interpreted so sweepingly. And secondly, that English law cannot be robbed of its morally upstanding uh, nature and cannot be allowed to treat racism as a relevant excuse for acting in an unreasonable way. I am much obliged. Thank you very much. Oh. My apologies, my, my lord. It's the junior council. Oh, okay. Sorry. So I'm just checking the audio. Yep. Yeah. Um, may I please, your lordship, as indicated before, I'm Anjali Jain. And I'll be appearing today as a junior appealing for our client, Edward Walcott, on the second round of appeal. I have two submissions to make, which are as follows. First, in the scope of voluntary non-fit injuria, a mentally fit victim's conscious refusal of a life-saving medical treatment for his racial views acts as an acceptance of all harm resulting from such dangerous act. Secondly, the victim, by refusing medical treatment, broke the chain of causation as no one's act is intervening, even though the injury was not life-threatening. If it may please your lordship, may I proceed with my first submission? I'm much obliged. The victim knew what he was getting into and the risk of harm that came from the violent act as the uh, violent issue. It is statutory and a fair principle that a tort feeser cannot be held responsible for injury or damages to which a victim voluntarily and with his open eyes consents to. The council would like to refer your lordship to the case of Cran versus Cheshire in 1991. Uh, before continuing, would you like a brief summary of the case? No, that's fine. I'm not sure of that. Uh, referring to the page nine, 16 of the bundle, 
in summary, in this case, it has been directed by the jury that the claimant was to be responsible for the death of the victim unless the medical staff had been reckless in their treatment. Applying this to our case, Mr. Walker cannot be held responsible for the death of the victim as he had voluntarily and in his right consciousness of his mind refused all medical care for an injury that was not life threatening. By a professional doctor due to his racial and unreasonable views. So it cannot be concluded that the stab was the sole cause of the victim's death in the orbit of voluntary not put injury. Can I just interrupt you there? Is it your view that the law states that in order to be liable for murder, the defendant must be the sole cause of the death? No. So in this case, in our case, the Injury was not life threatening. I could have been healed with a little medical care, not even an extensive medical care, and refusing to do so on just of his racial views. And the sole reason that he actually got into that fight with our client is uh, what we're asking. Um, the council would like to request lordship to refer to the case of Cor versus IBC Vehicles Limited 2008. And before I continue, would your lordship appreciate a brief summary of the case? I'm much obliged. Proce proceeding. Please may I refer your lordship to the highlighted section of page 19 of the case bundle. Here with the reference to the case of Crown versus Kennedy number 2, 2007, it has been submitted that if an adult of sound mind chooses for whatever reason to inflict injury upon himself, this is an act for which responsibility cannot be laid on another. If your lordship has no further questions, may I proceed with my second submission? Can I just ask you, uh, in this case, in Kennedy, it's rightly said that if a person of sound mind inflicts an injury on themselves, then the chain of causation is broken. But in this case, the defendant, can, the, the, the victim did no such thing. So the victim on his own conscious mind had put himself in a position in front of our client to be in a position like that where he could be have like hurt and that could be actually life threatening. Thank you for your question. For my second submission, the council would like to refer your lodge of the case of White versus Davidson, 1992, as referred in the case of Core versus IBC Vehicles, 2008. Uh, would you like a brief summary of the case? I'm not sure. Refer to the page 20 of the bundle. Uh, this is not the less or whether independent superior cause is a voluntary informed decision taken by the victim as an adult of sound mind making a given effect to a personal decision about his own life. Quote. And so suicide could be novus actus if a person takes his own life as a conscious decision in the absence of disabling mental illness. Damages attributed to the death were rendered too remote because the disease conduct was unreasonable. Novus actus intervenes was an unreasonable conduct on the part of the pursuers as potentially breaking the cause of causation. Concluding the victim's conduct, one, the novus actus issue broke the chain of causation and constituted as novus actus intervenes. Two, the unreasonable act issue was an unreasonable act which broke the chain of causation. Three, the voluntary issue was the voluntary act of the disease and so precluded by the principal voluntary non-fit injury. Unless your lordship has no further questions, that concludes my submissions on this kind of appeal. Okay. The council respectfully appeal of the court appeal go to all of the appeal. Sorry. Yes. Yes, your lordship. Apologies.
Maisel, please your lordship. NS has, NS has already been indicated by my learned friends. My name is Mr. Conor Neal, and I'll be acting as the lead respondent on behalf of the Crown. I will be responding to the first ground of appeal today, and my learned colleague, Ms. Chelsea Choi, will be responding to the second ground of appeal. I have two submissions to make, but before I proceed, would your lordship appreciate a brief reacquaintance with the facts of this case? Yes, Much obliged, your lordship. My first submission is that the Honourable Trial Judge did not err in his reliance upon the Crown against Blau as authority that the appellant's culpability should not be negated by the victim's reasoning to refuse treatment, be it reasonable or unreasonable. The decision, the decision stands as good law and the eggshell skull rule should apply. May I please now direct your Lordship's attention to page seven of the bundle in paragraph H in the section highlighted in green. Sorry, can you page seven again? Um, page seven, your lordship. Okay. So page seven and paragraph H. There should be a section highlighted in green, but if not, well, I'll just read out the quote. Lord Justice Lawton says that it has long been a policy of the law that those who use violence on other people must take their victims as they find them. This, in our judgment, means the whole man, not just the physical man. It does not lie in the mouth of the assailant to say that his victim's religious beliefs, which inhibit him from accepting certain kinds of treatment, were unreasonable. His lordship statement implies the court's consideration of not just a person's physical characteristics, but also their spiritual, emotional, and psychological values and beliefs when applying the eggshell skull rule. Mr. Walcott should take Mr. Stevens as he finds him, with Mr. Stevens' own beliefs. Mr. Walcott, as the assailant, should not be able to escape his liability for inflicting a grievous and ultimately mortal wound by simply saying that the victim's beliefs are unreasonable. And to say that only religious faith is deserving of the law's protection is to say that the law views religious faith as superior to free opinion. Surely this must not be so. I will now be relying on the case of Reeti Adult Refusal of Treatment, which is located on page nine of the bundle. May I humbly request your Lordship's permission to forego the case facts as they are not relevant to my submission. Much obliged, your Lordship. May I now direct your Lordship to page 11 um, in paragraph B in the section highlighted in green, where Lord Donaldson states that the adult patient is accordingly entitled to refuse treatment on religious or personal grounds. There is no specific mention of a requirement of reasonableness. Blau is not the only case that excludes any mention of reasonableness. May I? Yes, your Lordship. It's one thing that a person is permitted to refuse medical treatment. Beliefs, however, abhorrent they are. It's another thing for the court to decide that the chain of causation is appropriate on the basis of an abhorrent belief. Why should the defendant in this case be held responsible on the basis of the victim's abhorrent choices? Thank you for your question, Your Lordship. It is, it is counsel's belief that because the stabbing of the victim is the operational cause of the wound in the first place, there shouldn't be a break in the chain of causation just because the adult patient or the adult victim refuses to have any sort of medical treatment whatsoever. It is our understanding that bec because of that initial wound, he will not have been placed in that position. And it is that reason that the cause of that damage is so significant that it should stand as the only and operative cause of the death, ultimate death of the victim. And therefore, the, I, we feel like the court should take this into account as well as like the right anybody has to make their own decision and to refuse medical treatment. Much obliged, Your Lordship. May I please now direct Your Lordship's attention to page seven of the bundle. Uh, we are going back to the case of the Crown against Blau. In this section, um, paragraphs E and G in the section highlighted in green, Lord Justice Lawton brings up the prominent issue of having entirely different judgments if the court were to enforce a requirement of reasonableness. This is unavoidable due to the subjective nature of assessing the standards by which something is reasonable. What might be reasonable for someone may be quite the contrary for the other, leading to judgments that depend entirely on the profile of the jury involved and could go either way, jeopardizing the very right or the very idea of a fair trial. With the reasons given above, I submit that there is, there, should, there is no and there should not be any requirement of reasonableness and Blau should be applied as precedent and good law in this case, such that the eggshell skull rule applies and the victim's personal choice to refuse medical treatment 
should not be an excuse for the assailant or the appellant to escape liability for murder after conducting the initial stabbing. Is it not the law that reasonable is this taken into account in many check cases of law that breaks in the chain of causation, such as Williams and Davies and other cases? Well, yes, Your Lordship. It is true that the test applied in the Crown against Williams and Davis is standing as good law, but the distinguishing factor between the case of Williams and Davis and this case is again the operative cause of the wound or the death in that manner. In Williams and Davis, well, if I remember correctly, the facts of the case were that the hitchhiker threw himself out of the car and killed himself ultimately because of the fear that the defendants were trying to rob him. So the cause of his death um, is by his own actions by throwing himself out of the car. And that is the operative cause of the wound. That is the victim's own action. Whereas in this case, it is not the victim's own action that led to his own death. He did not stab himself. It is, in fact, the appellant that stabbed him. And in that sense, we feel like there should be a distinction factor in which the chain of causation should not be broken, simply because of a decision by the victim to allow himself to die from that wound that was not inflicted by himself. Much obliged, Your Lordship. Um, May I please request for one more minute to just wrap up my second submission, yeah. please? Much obliged, Your Lordship. Um, for my second submission, uh, we submit that the victim's right to make a decision must be upheld, and in doing so, his, de his decision to refuse medical treatment must be respected. Um, I'll be quoting from the case of T, which can be found on page 10, paragraph B, but it's a simple sentence. An adult patient is entitled to refuse consent to treatment irrespective of the wisdom of his decision. This entitlement is also enshrined under Articles 9 and 10 of the Human Rights Act 1998, as seen in page 20, which are the freedom of thought, be belief and religion, as well as the freedom of expression, respectively. Um, uh, just mentioning the case of Sideway against the Board of Governors of Bethlehem Royal Hospital, um, quoting from Lord Scarman in his obiter, Lord Scarman notes that the responsibility of judges to extend uh, existing principles to cover a right recognized by law when it's and when it is not adequately protected. Furthermore, his lordship acknowledges that, that the patient does have a right to make his own decision. If the court were to allow this appeal by the parents, it will be an undermining of the victim's right to make his own decision regarding his own medical treatment, going against the very essential principle of protecting a right recognized by law. Here ends my second and final submission. If your lordship has no further questions, uh, I hereby invite this honorable court to dismiss the appeal. Much obliged, lordship. Hello, am I audible? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> May it please your lordship, as indicated before, my name is Ms. Chelsea Choi, acting as junior counsel on behalf of the respondent. In response to the second ground of appeal, I have two submissions to make. Firstly, that the initial stab wound is the operative and substantial cause of death. And secondly, that the victim's conduct did not amount to an, a novus actus intervenience. If it pleases the court, may I proceed with my first submission? Um, I will first address the issue that the initial stab wound uh, must be seen as an operative and substantial cause of the death. Uh, please may refer your lordship to the, the case of the Crown against Smith in the highlighted paragraph of page 25 of the bundle. Would your lordship appreciate a brief summary of the facts of the case? So in this case, the defendant stabbed the victim who then received negligent medical treatment and the victim died of his injuries. And the issue was whether the doctor's negligence was capable of breaking the chain of causation between the stabbing of the victim and his ultimate death. Um, so in this case, Chief Justice Lord Parker established that if at the time of the death, the original wound is still, operating, still an operating and substantial cause, then the death is the result of the wound, albeit that some other cause of death is also operating. And he also continues to say that only if the second cause is so overwhelming that um, it makes um, the original wound merely part of history, then only it can be said as um, the wound exists. So in this case, it's clear that the stab wound was the substantial and operative cause of the death and was the sole cause of death because the, the victim did not make a positive act. His omission was definitely not so overwhelming that it can negate the appellant's liability. 
And even in the case of the Crown against Cheshire on page 31, paragraph H of the bundle, um, where Lord Justice Beldum explained that as long as the defendant's act contributed significantly to the death, the jury should not regard it as excluding the, responsi excluding the responsibility of the defendant. Thus, yes. If the people carrying the stretcher had thrown the victim off because they were racists and the victim was an ethnic minority, then the chain of causation would not have been broken in that version of the case. Sorry, Mala, could you repeat that question? Is it your view that if in R and Smith, rather than them dropping the victim by accident, they'd thrown the victim off intentionally because they were racists, but the staff room still contributes, but the chain of causation would then not have been broken? Um, it still would have been broken because um, it can be distinguished because in the case of Smith, it was about ne negligent medical treatment. But in this case, the operative substantial cause of the death was the stabbing. And in this case, um, the stabbing was the substantial and operative cause of death and was the sole cause of death. And in the Smith case, the throwing the victim off was another factor of death, but in here, the victim um, did not make a positive act. He did not um, do anything to accelerate the death. He only refused medical treatment. I'm much obliged. So in the case of Crown against Cheshire, Lord Justice Beldum explained that um, as long as the defendant's act contributes significantly to the death, then um, he should be held liable. So applying the same principles to the case, it's clear that the appellant must be held liable. And um, that is all for my first submission. May I please move on to my second submission? My second submission is about the victim's choice to refuse treatment and how it did not amount to a novus actus intervenience. So looking at the same case of the Crown against Cheshire, Lord Justice Beldum had agreed that a positive act of commission or an act of omission will serve to break the chain of causation only if it's accelerated the death. So in addressing this issue, the victim's refusal clearly did not accelerate death and much less cause death. And because of that, it cannot be seen as an intervening act that broke the chain of causation. And lastly, going back to the case of the Crown against Blau, um, this out the outcome of this case wholly supports the current case where case facts are similar, since in both cases the victims were stabbed but refused treatment, thus dying. So if I could refer your lordship to page 7 of the bundle, paragraph H, where the judge established that the fact that the victim refused to stop this end coming about did not break the, co the casual connection between the act and the death. So since the similar case facts apply, this case sets out to be precedent to be followed and proves that the victim's conduct in this case does not amount to a novus actus intervenience. Lastly, I would just like to um, respond to the opposing counsel's um, argument that, especially in their skeleton argument, they mentioned that uh, the principle of voluntary non-fit injuria. So this defense should be limited to tort law and should not be applicable in criminal law and even more so for murder, because this defense is related to consent regarding the voluntary assumption of risk. Um, in using this, offense, this defense, it would be saying that the victim knowingly placed um, himself at risk and that criminal behavior is to be expected. And this should not, um, should not and does not negate the appellant's liability and obligation to not engage in criminal activity. So, and furthermore, nobody can consent to consent to being killed. So with that, Your Lordship, I submit that the initial stab wound is an operative and substantial cause of the death and that the victim's omission um, did not amount to a novus actus intervenience. And on top of the applicable, uh, inapplicable principles submitted by the opposing counsel, the appellant's conviction should be upheld. Much obliged.
Much obliged. We view that the key issue exhibited by the respondents in their speech is that in places they seem to be arguing a vision of English law which is downright nihilistic. They continue to persist with the position that the case of Blau speaks about all personal beliefs and not just those which are religious and thereby unprovable and through this assumed to be uh, reasonable regardless of whether they are. What we must remember is that the law does not view these issues, uh, these opinions objectively. A reference to the Human Rights Act was made, uh, unrightfully so. No one is denying the victim's right to hold these views. What we are saying is that they are unreasonable and as such can intervene in the chain of causation. When it comes to the law's opinions on racism specifically, they are far from objective. When we look into statute, we quickly see that a racial motivation behind a crime is an aggravating factor, which leads to additional months and years being sprinkled onto people's sentences in the matter which is far from objective. And it would be firstly confusing and secondly contradictory for the law to suddenly say that that kind of motivation is somehow irrelevant in how we consider causation in law. Apart from this, we should also consider that the strongest cases uh, in favour of reasonability not playing a role uh, in deciding whether a um, act by the victim was a breach in the chain of causation is that a lot of them will pertain to cases where there was actually no victim and no criminal. For example, RE-T was about a decision made uh, along with medical professionals. The person wasn't actually assaulted by anyone. No one stood to serve jail time based on how reasonable or un unreasonable that person's decision was. And on that basis, we feel that thinking specifically about the safety of convictions for murder, we should note that it is in that it, it is decisively possible for a victim purely by the unpredictability and unreasonability of their actions to sufficiently divert the cause of their death from what the assailant had done to make them co-responsible or entirely responsible for what happens to them in the end. And on this basis, we invite the court to allow this appeal. Much obliged. Uh, thank you very much for your submissions. Let me take some time to deliberate and then I will return to the judgment. All right, well, firstly, thank you to our excellent mooters and to our judge. Um, we're going to go through a quick presentation and then hopefully we can do the scores afterwards, if that's OK. Um, so, yeah, sorry about the QR code. Um, hopefully that should be working. But we've got a few things which we want to run over with you guys about what we've got planned this year and what you guys can get involved with. So essentially, if you still, if you're still not sure about what mooting is, Having watched that, you know, mooting is essentially a mock appeal case which is centred around a fictitious legal problem. In this scenario, it was to do with causation within the context of criminal law. What I will make clear is that even if the facts are fictional, the errors of law which are in contention are real errors of law, and you will go over them uh, over the course of your law degree. Um, and I'm guessing, I'm sure Victor knows, this is a pretty big part of the first term of criminal law when you look at uh, the actus reus. Um, and mooting also involves following skills, which are very helpful. Um, you've got, let's go back for a moment, you've got reading and analyzing the problem. That's the first thing which you need to do. Um, if you guys sign up to the first year competition, when the sign ups close, we'll send everybody an email. And the first thing you'll see in that email is a copy of the moot problem. Um, alongside that, it's also researching the relevant area of law. In this case, both sides had to research uh, the area of law around causation. Um, and then you've also got to prepare written submissions. Um, and then advocacy is a very, very big part of meeting within itself. Um, even if the moot is online, you are expected to speak properly. You are expected to uh, essentially deliver your submissions um, as if you're doing it off by heart. Um, and then, as we saw over the course of the moot, a key part of it is being able to think on your feet when the judge kind of puts you um, in the spotlight and asks you what can sometimes be a very complex um, legal question. And you might only have a matter of 
seconds to kind of come up with a response. Um, but you, there are a number of skills which you can develop and you can take uh, forward. And this kind of brings us on to why you should move. Um, so th the main kind of benefit is that it really hones your advocacy and legal analytical skills, um, which will be of really big benefit to you academically. Um, personally, I know for a fact that mooting definitely helped me to get a much better understanding of certain areas of tort or criminal law, which um, I didn't necessarily understand straight away. Um, and that's purely because you have to look at it from a slightly more dynamic angle. Um, and when you go through the case law, when you read the law reports, that's where you kind of, um, uh, a kind of light bulb kind of clicks in your head saying, OK, now I get it. Because you can see how the law is being explained and how it applies. Um, and there's also a set of invaluable transferable skills which you'll gain. Um, and they're the holy trinity, as, as I called them. So you've got problem solving public speaking and teamwork. A big part of meeting is working with someone else. You will get partnered up. Um, that can either be with somebody of your own choice. If you don't have a partner, that's not an issue. We will pair you up with someone else. Um, and as they say, teamwork makes a dream work. So having a really good dynamic with your partner, making sure they're organized, making sure they're there for each other is something which is really important, not only for meeting, but going forward with whatever career aspirations that you have. And that's why it looks really, really good on your CV and applications. And it gives you something to kind of tell a story about. And it can help you stand out if you've done really, really well. But fundamentally, and don't forget, even though there's a lot of work and time which goes into it, it's a very self-rewarding process. It's very fun. Um, and if you get to a really, if you get quite far to uh, through one of the competitions, um, that uh, feeling of having done really well, of the process being really rewarding, it, it's a really, really nice feeling. Um, so in respect to what you can do to get involved this year, we've got a number of things uh, planned. So the first thing is the first year meeting competition. So the sign-ups are going to be open today and the deadline will be next Wednesday. Uh, we've got the QR code at the end of the slideshow, so we'll get to that in a bit. Um, we've got the Advocacy Move. That's going to be a collaboration competition with the Bar Society. That's just another smaller competition, similar structure to the first year meeting competition, just to give people another opportunity to move if um, they might have been unsuccessful with the first year competition. Uh, and then in term two, we've got the internal meeting competition. That's our biggest competition of the year. We aim to do the final in the Supreme Court. And if we're lucky, we're hoping to get a sitting Supreme Court judge to judge the final. So um, that would be a really fantastic opportunity um, to obviously spectate and obviously participate in as well. And then we have the commercial meeting competition, which is normally sponsored by HSF, uh, a big international law firm. And uh, since um, the pandemic isn't much of an issue now, uh, assuming they'll be sponsoring us, we're hoping to do the final in their head office in London. Um, and then we'll have a number of intervarsity meets throughout the year. The main one we do is with the London School of Economics, and that's in term two. Um, if you want to meet next term, but you want to see how our competitions work, um, something we are going to be doing, and this is totally new for this year, is um, we're going to open up sign-ups to everybody to clerk our moots. So clerking is essentially what Harry did. He had to set up the room, you have to uh, take a note of the time and ensure that all the meters and the judge is aware of how much time they have. So it's a very straightforward role, but it's a good way to kind of get a first-hand insight into what a moot looks like. Um, so yeah, if you want to get involved, make sure to sign up for the competition um, and come along to our How to Meet workshop, which is this Friday. It's not going to be in the medical building, don't worry. It's going to, it, it will be in the Zeman building, which is um, much more accessible. Um, and that will be running from five to seven. Um, so yeah, hopefully this QR code works. Um, and just a reminder, the deadline is on Wednesday. So uh, not this Wednesday, next Wednesday. So yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you all get involved. And um, yeah. yeah, yeah. if you have any questions, go for it. If not, we can wait until the schools and you know, once Victor's given us feedback, we can get into questions. And after you scan that uh, QR code, there's another first year only opportunity uh, for clerking uh, that I would encourage you to sign up for. Uh, are we all done with this code or can we move on? I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Yes.
if you can't access it, don't worry. We are going to have a post coming up tomorrow with a link uh, in the Law Society's Instagram bio. So that should work. No, uh, it's okay. Don't worry. You're fine. You're fine. And then that's for our clerking um, opportunity. The only thing I will say, and this <laughs> mentioned on the form, right? Um, if you've signed up for the first year competition, um, you can't sign up for this because the two will clash. However, what we do have in the form is we made it very clear um, if you want to clerk, say, for example, in this term, then you can tick that box. If you want to clerk in term, you can tick that or you can tick both. Um, by ticking one of the boxes, you have the opportunity to clerk in either of the two terms. But then in the term where you're not clerking, you can compete in the competitions that we have on offer. So hopefully that works, but we will also have a separate post for that on our Instagram page. So you can sign up there as well. All good. Yeah, perfect way for you guys to get involved, by the way, because it really doesn't like, you know, if you feel like you're not really that comfortable with talking to people, for example, this is a perfect way for you to get involved and also get something on your CV, even though you've just started at the law school. So. Without further ado, so to you, Victor. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, both teams for excellent submission. Uh, I'm now going to first give my legal judgment and then I will give the judgment of uh, who won the moot. These are independent judgments. So the first one is about which uh, side won in terms of the legal argument and how the case should be decided. The second is about who won the moot overall. With respect to the legal arguments, overall I found the case of the respondents to be compelling and I am going to decide in their favour. And let me give the reasons why. The case of R and Blau has two elements to it. Uh, the chain of causation uh, might be broken on two different kinds of grounds. One concerns the reasonableness of the victim's conduct, and the other concerns whether it was an act or an omission. It's clear that the reasonableness standard applies to acts by the victim, where if those acts are completely unreasonable and they dominate the causal um, structure, then the chain of causation is broken. That, though, is much less clear where we're dealing with a failure to mitigate an injury that the victim has suffered, as was the case here and was the case in R and Blau. Now, it is true that in R and Blau there's a discussion of whether the conduct of the victim is reasonable or unreasonable, and that is disregarded. And it was right, I think, for the appellants to raise the issue that the, um, that the failure to get treatment in this case was wholly abhorrent in a way that wasn't true in R and Brown. Nevertheless, I think it's still the case that although the um, victim's conduct in this case was wholly abhorrent and unreasonable, given the reasons why they didn't seek treatment, nevertheless, because it was an omission, the operating cause of death was still the stab wound. It didn't prevent the wound from being the primary cause of the death. And that's what's at issue in this case. The issue is who caused the death? Was the defendant's conduct a substantial operating cause of the death? And in this case, I find that it was. As a result, I find that the defendant murdered the victim. And so I'm afraid that I need to um, deny the appeal and uphold the conviction. Okay, now let me move on to who won the moot. It was a very close call, but in this case, the respondents also won the moot by a very small margin. In this case, the overall scores were 45 to 43, but I thought both sides did an excellent job of understanding the legal issues. I thought overall, um, there were um, very good arguments on both sides, drawing extremely well from legal authorities. There was an imaginative use of authorities on both sides beyond the standard authorities that we find in the criminal law, which I thought was helpful and informative and showed interesting legal arguments. Both sides spoke confidently about the issue and used appropriate etiquette in the course. In the end, I thought that the most important thing for both sides to do was to get more clarity. This was where I thought there was a slight weakness on both sides, was to get more clarity in distinguishing the acts and omissions issue from the reason on this issue. Those issues, I thought, were by both sides to some extent run together, and it would have been very helpful to separate out those arguments, both to try to respond to the problem of omissions on the part of the appellants, 
and to hammer home the significance of the emissions on the part of the respondents. So I thought in neither case did they deal with the emissions issue quite as separately from the reasonableness issue as you might have done. I thought that would have in both cases improved things. Overall, I thought in terms of both the, 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 the clarity and the tendency to separate out, out those issues though, that the respondents overall were more successful. So that uh, is the end of my ruling. But let me just say, I thought both sides did an absolutely terrific job, very, very well researched, very well argued and uh, excellent performance overall. So thanks very much for your contribution to the moves and uh, I hope to see you all again. I'd like to just say one more thing since we have a captive audience. Um, as, as good of an opportunity as clerking is, just because the first year's moot is in term one and we'd rather not have uh, four people competing and 20 people clerking. Um, I thought I'd say Connor and I are going to be in charge of that competition and we invite all of you to uh, apply who are eligible because it is the best chance you're going to get to argue your cases in an environment where the other people are no better than you, where you have no reason to be scared of them, where everyone is a beginner and where there is a uh, strong priority placed on giving you guys detailed feedback in a way that helps you develop uh, both as mooters and as lawyers in general. And so for that reason, I would uh, seriously uh, invite you to um, have a go and see how far you can get in our tournament. Thanks very much. Yep. Two final, final things to say, don't go yet. Um, so as you're aware, um, we have a subcommittee, we also have mini masters of the moots. Um, the more mooting experience that you build up this year, the more likely it is that you'll make it into those positions, I think, next year. And it's really val it's a stepping stone, like most things in law school. One thing leads to another, success inspires success. So please try and sign up as much as you can, but also be aware of the time commitments because. We want you to sign up and stay in the competition. So please, when you sign up, be aware of, it's not, it's not hey, quite so heavy, but be aware of what you're signing up to. Uh, final thing is, um, anyone care to share what we think? Uh, do you think it's reasonable that, um, you know, what, what do we think about this case? Uh, anyone care to share? Is it okay, for example, uh, would it be all right for someone to refuse treatment because of their own racial biases and, you know, for that chain of causation to continue? What do we think? Racism, yay or nay? <laughs> <laughs> but um, racism, yay or nay, but also uh, what do we think about the law? What Do you think the law is just? Do you think it needs changing? Anyone care to give it a shout? Fine, if not. Yeah. What do we think? This is a little bit rogue, but I wouldn't expect it to be in favour, like legally of that side. Like, just thinking that the action, that, uh, I can't remember his name, but Gustavo, the action that he did remain the same regardless of the outcome. So it seemed as if we were more kind of, I thought that it seemed, if it wasn't against him, that the law was kind of punishing the outcome rather than the action that the guy did, which I just thought would be the other way around. Like, I thought, regardless of what the outcome is, he did the same thing, so that's going to be punished in the same way, rather than, oh, yeah, this is what happened because of the action, so that's how we're going to punish it. But, it's a great point, I mean, as you'll, you'll see later on in the course, often how you get treated in the law is a bit of a matter of luck, so you could do two very similar things and be guilty of completely different outcomes, so for example, if I try and shoot you and I miss, I'm guilty of attempt with murder. If I hit, I'm guilty of murder, and those are different results. In that case, they carry you the same sentence, but in other cases, you're quite likely to get different sentences. So for example, if I'm a very negligent doctor and I don't kill someone, then I'm probably guilty of nothing at all. If I kill someone, I'm guilty of manslaughter, and I can get a very heavy sentence. So there's luck all over the criminal law, which is one of the surprising features of it. Some people really want to eliminate it. Some people think the outcomes really do matter. So you're certainly right, Justin. Yep. What about over there? I just 
stabbing was much greater than the action of uh, denying the treatment. So I think that the issue is fine. I mean, to be fair, the case was actually not super clear. But my own view is that the right view should be that the clinical data should be broken by omissions, even if the person decides on. I don't think there is a reasonable assessment, there shouldn't be one. But Blau, the case which was the main case that was involving the that was, that was discussed, is actually very unclear on that point because it gets into the issue of whether, um, you know, how could the court decide on whether it's reasonable or unreasonable? And in a way, it invites the response that says, well, it's not in dispute in this case, the racist case. Might be disputed in the Jehovah's Witness case where you might not want to take a stance on religious belief, but the law's quite happy to take a stance on racist belief. And so, in a way, Blau invites that sort of argument. But actually, the way it should have been decided, I think Blau was just it's an omission, so there's no break in the chain of causation. End of story. That would have been the clearer judgment. The judges, another you'll find in the cases is that they, they won't come to a decision. And you shove some stuff in, but it's not always very well thought through. I mean, the best will in the world, judges are not always uh, perfect in their reasoning. Yes. And uh, so when you read these cases, sometimes you're like, okay, there's more than one thing going on in this case, not clear exactly how it works. It's a bit of luck. It's a bit of luck that you yeah. get. That's also true. Okay, final thoughts? Anyone? Yep. Go ahead. It's a very different thing from uh, omitting a med medical treatment and because you don't want to be touched by a black person or due to some sort of racist belief. So I think over there um, it does matter like why you are choosing to omit the treatment and I think according to that the it depends like whether the chain of causation is broken or not. I mean, it certainly matters for some purposes. The question is why it should matter for who caused the death. That's the puzzle here. And it's not so obvious why it should matter for who caused the death. I mean, wasn't it still the person who bled to death because they were sad? That seems like the clear. Right, but should they have got the medical treatment? They wouldn't have. Yeah, no doubt they should have done, and uh, they wouldn't have bled to death. And no doubt the decision was problematic. But now, why isn't it true still that? The reason why the person died is because they were stabbed. That's how it's I should want to say one more thing about mooting as well, which is like um, I did my first mooting in undergraduate and it was totally awful. I fell apart really badly and made a horrible mess of it. And look where I am today, still making a mess of things. So it doesn't get any better. No, it does, it does get better. Even if it's really humiliating and it goes horribly wrong. Um, it, uh, uh, it, it's pretty low stakes at the start, and so uh, don't worry about it too much. And as you can see, I mean, the toughest thing I think is responding to the judge when you ask. I asked you a really tough question. I'm sorry with a hypothetical. I thought afterwards it was a bit silly because it was a little bit hard to get a grip on straight away. So responding on your feet to tough questions like that is is a serious challenge, but it's something which is incredibly useful. And going on as your in your in your law degree, as you'll see from my lectures, I ask lots of questions to my students in the lectures too. So be prepared to do this kind of thing. Uh, I'm only giving four, but in, in those four, uh, 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 be, be prepared. To yeah, thank you so much, Victor. Yeah. Can we earn a commission on refusing to the treatment? Can like I don't know if it's right or not. Like, can it be compared to a suicide or like uh -huh. um, like people when like they're in a hospital or they just yeah, so in the action cases involving suicides, in some rare cases, the chain of causation is not broken, but in some cases it is. So in the case where the person um, had voluntary euthanasia because they suffered such terrible injuries they couldn't live with them, then yeah. um, the chain of causation was not broken. Okay, so can the people also use this as a, as a reason and not, like, can be in a court, like, if I'm... Uh, like 
Okay. That's I mean, a really good question. Yeah. yeah. I just I was like I didn't think of that, but. Well, there you go. That's the thing with meeting. If you have a knack for being creative, if you have a knack for thinking critically, then it's an activity which we'd encourage you to get really stuck in because you never know what you'll get out of it. Um, so, yeah, please do sign up and please do come along to the session on Friday. We're looking forward to seeing many of you there. Um, if you need to head off to the uh,